Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Svarim Chatter podcast. On this episode of the podcast, I'm going to be joined by Professor Kenneth Stowe, who is Professor Emeritus of Jewish History at the University of Haifa in Israel, and he has been a visiting professor at Yale, the University of Michigan, the University of Washington, Smith College, the, the University of Toronto, and the Pontifical Gregorian University. He, has, he founded the journal Jewish History and served as its editor for 25 years until 2012. And the book we're going to be discussing today is a uh, relatively recent publication, a few years, Anna and Tranquilo, Catholic Anxiety and Jewish Protest in the Age of Revolutions. He also wrote uh, Theaters of Acculturation, the Roman Ghetto in the 16th Century, as well as Alienated Minority, the Jewish, the Jews of Medieval Latin Europe, as well as a number of other books and, and, and many articles as well. So thank you, Professor Stowe, for joining me today. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, and I'm really delighted to talk about this book and about Italian jewelry that most people don't even know exists. They think they're Sfardim, when in fact they're Italkim, strictly Italkim. Uh, and uh, they have their own rituals and uh, they, are, they have a certain distinction because they are the only Jews in Europe who you really can't call immigrants. You can't call Italian Jews immigrants because they were there at the time of Julius Caesar, and in fact, uh, probably for a hundred or so years before. And in that sense, there's almost nobody in Rome who predates them. Uh, and uh, their language, of course, is uh, Italian. It's always been whatever the language of the day has been, first Latin and then the devolutions of Latin, but uh, they speak Italian. And in fact, uh, when I was working for the Book Theater of Acculturation, working on notaries. A notary in Europe is not like a notary in America, just somebody who approves your signature. It's almost a lawyer. They take down witnesses. They, 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 they not only do things like, uh, like being a Sofer Stam, but they, uh, uh, they, they, they depose witnesses. They, they write contracts and so on and so forth. And uh, I once wrote an article uh, writing in Hebrew because they were rabbis and they wrote in Hebrew, uh, but thinking in Italian. And the, the classic example, and of course you have to know modern Romance languages to appreciate this, every house they rent is Habayit Shela. Now, you know Hebrew, I mean, it's her house. But how can every house be her house? Ah, think Italian. In Italian, as in French or Spanish, the pronoun always agrees in gender with the, with the noun itself. But wait a minute, you're saying bite is masculine despite the ending. So shouldn't it be a bite cello? No, but in Italian, it's feminine. So it's casa su and it's a bite cello. So you can see how Roman they were. My motto was they were as Roman as they were Jewish and as Jewish as they were Roman. And of course, today, I'm sure that some people and the, who are listening uh, have been in Rome and have been in the ghetto or the area of the ghetto. Because there's no ghetto left. It was completely razed at the end of the 19th century because it was just a health hazard. But you go to that area where the ghetto is. It's a very, very small area. Uh, I'm trying to think of what to compare it to in the, in the United States. It's like Battery Park or something. Uh, and... Uh, and you 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 go there, and it's it's now become a kind of a circus with a lot of lot of restaurants and kosher restaurants. But 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 in any case, it's there, and it's the place of the Jews, and it used to be much more the place of the Jews. I remember going, and somebody said, "Well, this coffee is better because in Nostro, it's ours. Uh, it's very much very significantly theirs, and a, a third of it is taken up by the synagogue." And uh, I must tell you, the, the, it's a place with, with absolutely awful acoustics. You're in the mouth of a cone. So you, you, you can't follow, you can't hear anything that's going on. Uh, but uh, to hear the shofar blown, and they blow it differently, it's a continuous blowing, a continuous wailing. To hear the shofar blown there, the first time I heard it on a Rosh Hashanah, I got goosebumps. And I'm not a particular, that's not my style of person, but I got goosebumps. I said, now I know how the walls of Yericho fell. Um, it, it was really amazing. But what if you went to an Italian synagogue? You know, if you're, if you're an Ashkenazi and you go to a, to a Mizrahi synagogue, 
even though the Sidur is close, you're going to be lost, but not in Rome. The melodies are different, but you're not going to be lost for a second. Why? Because the Ashkenazi is really a derivative of the Italian. Most people don't know that, but it is. And there is a, uh, a wonderful uh, legend that uh, somewhere in the 10th century, Rabbi Colonimus of Luca, Luca is a city about halfway between Rome and the north of Italy uh, on the coast. Rabbi Colonimus of Luca went to Mainz. And I would ask students, well, tell me, uh, how did he go, Lufthansa or Alitalia? Uh, and, and, and actually I was able by tracing the routes that, that, that people took, I was able to follow him as, as he went across the mountains, you have to first cross the Apennines. I think you, most people know that there's a chain of mountains that runs down the spine of Italy called the Apennines. And at the very end, they turn into the Alps. And he first had to cross them, then go in the Po River Valley, which is flat. And from there, he had to cross the Alps. Now, you know, about just today, just get in your car and you ride through one of the two or three tunnels that go through and he, assuming that the tunnel doesn't catch fire and they all have, um, they're long. The longest, the Gotthard is uh, something like uh, 12 or 13 miles. It's, it's really long uh, and kind of frightening. I've driven, it. I've driven them all. Uh, and in those days you had to go over the Great St. Bernard Pass, which was uh, 2,500 meters or that's uh, something like 8,000 feet. It's, it's, it's quite a pass. You can drive it, it's, it's not, not hard. And it wasn't hard then either. You go up and you go down, down the rivers in Switzerland, and then up, the, the, uh, uh, up to, to the uh, Rhine River. So it's very important. And, and in fact, uh, there is a saying attributed to Rabbi Rabbeinu Tam, uh, who was reflecting on what went on in Southern Italy in the early century, early medieval centuries, saying, Ki mi mi, uh, mi bari tetsei Torah udvar Hashem mi Otranto. Another, uh, uh, Rabbi Nutam had no idea where these places were. They're way down in the heel, practically the heel of the Italian boot. And there was a flourishing Jewish culture there. What I'm trying to say is that the Jews have been in Italy forever. They're as Italian as they could possibly be. Yet if you go to the ghetto today, therefore, when you go to eat in these restaurants, people, all Romans go because they want to eat Roman traditional food, which is Jewish food. Uh, uh, some people may have heard of the famous carchofo uh, alla Judea, the Jewish artichoke, which is an incredible art to cut the thing and to double deep fry it. Uh, I'm not going to give lessons now, but I can do it. Uh, the uh, uh, and, and, and there are other things uh, and so on and so on, which make up the uh, traditional, traditional Roman diet. A lot of fried, wonderful fried things, zucchini flowers filled with mozzarella and, uh, uh, and anchovy paste. And you can get them there, they're kosher restaurants, you, can, you know, with supervision. Um, the, uh, the rabbi is, uh, the chief rabbi, um, uh, Ricardo Di Segni is, uh, quite strict about these things. He's a, by the way, he's a radiologist uh, by profession. Uh, I've known him for a million years, really, since we were young. Uh, and uh, he is, uh, he's, he's uh, an excellent, excellent person. He knows what he's doing and he's leading a very difficult community. Uh, the previous rabbi, Elia Toaf, uh, was, was a partisan during the war. And when he retired, it made national news. So the Jewish community in Rome is very small. We're not talking about uh, the community of New York. We're talking about 15,000 people out of 3 million. And uh, if you want to really see, be depressed on Yom Kippur, uh, go to Rome. You know, you have 3 million people living their daily lives, munching their, uh, their, their pizzas and God knows what. And there you are, you know, in your little angle and in your little corner uh, doing Yom Kippur. I mean, I've done that a couple of times, so uh, it's there. Where shall we go from here, Nathie? 
Okay, so so with that uh, terrific introduction, I mean, I, I would ask you on that because you're clearly very interested and you've written a lot of research on the Jews of Italy. And like I said, I've I've also I've done a couple of podcasts. Listeners may know I, to me they're fascinating. They're very unique and different. Like you said, I mean, how how did you? What was your interest in them that you decided to research them and I spend your life working on them? Is it something that just because they're so interesting? I mean, when did that start and how? Well, you know, most things that happen in research. Uh, they just sort of happen. You didn't expect it. Uh, and uh, what what happened was I started out and I wanted to write about the Jews in Roman and canon law. Why did I want to do that? Because I wasn't a great Talmud specialist. I, I made a mistake. But I, I studied it. Uh, I know it's Trafe. I studied at JTS. Uh, and... Uh, and, and I made a mistake. I didn't, I wasn't a Talmud major, and I should have been because I would have been able to study with uh, Professor Weiss Halivni Sheibadel Lachaim. He's 96 or something. And, uh, and I couldn't study with him. This was the greatest educational mistake of my life. So I, I couldn't begin to do dissertation on rabbinic literature. I could have, but I mean, it's not that I'm, a, you know, an Amharitz, but, I, but, but, uh, but nonetheless, I wanted to do this. I was turned on by it, and I had learned how to read it. It's not very hard. It's, it takes a day. It's not like learning to read Gemara, which takes your lifetime. Uh, the, uh, so so I, st- I started to do this, and I saw it was too big a topic, and uh, my advisor, Gershon Cohen, Sent me to um, uh, sent me to Elias Bickerman, a name that some people may know, an ancient historian at Columbia. His father was that it was a uh, an officer in the Russian army, and since he was Jewish, this was no small feat in the Tsar's army. Uh, and uh, and Bickerman said, "Young man, get yourself a text." And I laughed at him, and I found the text the next day, uh, which is a compendium of law on the Jews in. Roman and Canon Law by some guy who you've never heard of called Marquardo de Susanis. But it was it was the standard. It was the, the schlager of the day. Uh, and uh, and and uh, it uh, for a couple of hundred years. And so I worked on that and it was, was you know, very interesting. But this brought me into the question of the Jews and the popes directly and the Jews and the popes in Rome directly. Anyway, between one thing or another, I finished the dissertation and finally got to go to Israel, where I've never been able to go because there was a little thing called the Vietnam War. Uh, And uh, going was very dicey because they might have sent you to the jungle instead of to the desert. Uh, And I don't mean the the jungle of Israel, of course. So uh, I was finally able to go. And uh, I started to meet a lot of Italians, became very, very friendly with them, a small group of Italian Jews. And somehow or other, I just wound up going to Italy and being in Italy and uh, very close to a lot of Italians um, and um, speaking, learning to speak. Uh, My Italian is not quite as fluent as my Hebrew, but uh, it's very fluent. I mean, I'm not, I'm not afraid to write letters to people in, in, uh, in, in Italian, uh, especially with a spell checker on, uh, on <laughs> Gmail now. Um, but uh, it's uh, so, so I, you know, I've just been there nearly every year for the last uh, 50 years. Uh, and uh, there have been times I've spent months there and so on and so forth. So I feel very much uh, a part of, of Italian Jewry in that sense. And there was a time when if I'd be in Jerusalem, I would go to the, uh, uh, the Beit Knesset di Talki in uh, Jerusalem. And if anybody ever has a chance and doesn't get to go to Italy, uh, architect David Casuto built that little synagogue there to make it look exactly like an Italian synagogue. And the Ark itself is from Conigliano, which is uh, near Venice. Uh, and it's from the 18th century, so it's uh, and it's it's in use. It's in daily use there, so so it's very good. Anyway, that's how I got into it. Then, of course, what do you do? You start doing research, and I started going to the Vatican. After all, it had the uh, you know best library in town, uh, and and you c- you can get into the Vatican Library. It's not very hard, and uh, then just kept working and writing and finding things and so on and so forth. But I had known for a number of years of a special collection called the Notai Ebrei, the, the uh, Jewish 
And they, but they, in, in, in Italy, you don't call somebody a Judeo. That's, uh, that's a no-no. Uh, the Jews say themselves, son of Judeo. That's okay, but not if anyone else calls you, you know. Uh, and uh, but they're the Hebrew, the, the, the Hebrew notaries, the Jewish notaries. Uh, they began in the 16th century. They, they ran for about a hundred years. A father and son, um, Isaac uh, Yehuda and uh, Isaac uh, Piatelli, uh, which is, by the way, a very Jewish name. There are all kinds of names. If you walk down the main street in Rome, you read the names, and if you know, you know that oh, it's Cohen, let's Levy. It's you know, it's the same thing. The Castor di Verli, Di Segni, as in the chief rabbi. Uh, there, uh, these are all very, very Jewish names. Spitzkino, and so etc. 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 Well, uh, the uh, I, I started to to, to I, I, I said I'm going to do that. And I had a sabbatical and I went to Rome and I sat there copying these things. And this was in 1986. Today you just go in with your phone and you go. <laughs> And you photograph the whole thing and then come home and sit and read it. Not then, not then. So uh, that's how the theater of acculturation came about, in which I tried to categorize all this material. Um, but all the time, because we're headed towards Anan Tranquilo, uh, all the time I had in mind this book, uh, this, this diary that I'm talking about. Why? This book here was the original edition of the diary. Now I think uh, I think let me see where are the where are the pages? I, I had saw saw it earlier. Here it is. Here's a page of the diary, and I think you can see if you're good at reading Italian from the 18th century, then you can read this rather easily. Uh, it's not like reading. Latin stuff from the 14th century, nothing light, nothing at all. If you know Italian, you can read it. Uh, and the, the Hebrew too, it's a special script, but after, after about a week or so, you read it fluently. Uh, anyway, she, uh, this diary was published, uh, when was it published? About 40 years ago, 30 years ago, 1989, by Yosef Baruch Sermoneta. Now, Sermonetta was one of the, the, the great scholars and great human beings and the ultimate Roman Jew. He looked like a Roman Jew, which meant short and, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, he was uh, a magnificent scholar of literature. Uh, he revived something called Judeo-Italiano, which was an Italian Jewish language. It's written in Hebrew letters like it is from the 13th century. It's really considered a language unto itself. Uh, today, what remains is called Judeo-Romanesco, which uh, it, it's, it's, it's Italian with, with, with all kinds of special words in it. Um, and uh, it's it, not too many people know too much of it anymore, but uh, they, they just know a few phrases, principally for non-Jews and Ungarele and Anitzawe. Uh, but, uh, but there are, there, there are poets and poetry anyway. Well, this Sermonetta found this thing and he decided to publish it. I think more than he found it, it was within his family because there's only one manuscript copy of it. It's in Jerusalem and nobody, nobody knows who's got it. I think they do, his family. But Sermonetta, once he published this thing, once he transcribed it, there was no need for anybody to do anything else. He was, uh, he was such a great scholar and such a great human being, may I add. I, I really... I met him when I was 26 years old and he was welcoming and, and curious and very supportive. And it was that way until he died uh, sometime in the early nineties. Uh, well, uh, there's no need for anyone, as I say, to go back to the manuscript or go and look because it's done, it's done. But there was a question of getting it out. He published it first in something called Michael, which, uh, Shlomo Simonson was publishing, and then he did it on his own with notes. And the notes are very useful, but uh, I wanted to go further. I, I really, really said to myself, uh, look, you know, there's something more that can be done with this thing, to put, to put this, this young woman who's the subject of the diary into a context. And that's what I think I did uh, in the book, which uh, this is it. 
which we're talking about today. It's called Ana and Tranquilo. Now, it's the story of Ana Del Monte. Del Monte, you thought that was a pineapple company, but in fact, it's a very Roman Jewish name. It, it is, there are people who came from Southern France, you see, because people came in to the, the Roman community. There were Jews, of course, in centers other than uh, Rome, the most famous being Venice, but also Mantua. Uh, and, uh, and and Ferrara, those are the other well-known, but and Southern Italy too, but that was removed by expulsion. Uh, anyway, uh, the, the, the family in, in Hebrew, if you look in the listings in the community, they're listed as Hahar. So that's Montpellier probably, Hahar, the mountain. And in Italian, it becomes Del Monte. Uh, and they were a reasonably well-to-do family in the ghetto, uh, which is all the more reason to go after her, so to speak. Uh, and uh, uh, and her, her brother became one of the heads of the community after her. What do we have here? That I think is, is a principal question because when I first started to work on this book and gave it to people to read, they said, oh, well, it's a fiction. It's a, it's, it's a biographical fiction. Uh, it was a genre which was reasonably well known at the time. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, it, it's all made up. And then, fortunately, a census emerged in Rome from 1733. And there she was as a little girl, her family. And she was, a, so she's a real person. Furthermore, she was not the only one to undergo what she went, uh, what she what she underwent. In fact, uh, it was not unusual. Let me give you the background for this. Uh, in Rome, Jews had lived freely, openly, mixed with the population, as I intimated, for centuries and centuries and centuries. There were regulations, but it was with a, a kind of a light hand. After all, Jews were going in and out of the papal court, doing things for the popes, and so on and so forth. There was a limit to what the popes were really going to do with the Jews. And the Jews in Rome used to even represent Jews elsewhere uh, to, uh, uh, if, if there was a problem. And when there, we have some records of this in, in papal letters. And we have a lot of papal letters and I've worked on them too. Uh, I, I have actually, some of you may know the name of Solomon Grazel, who was the first to publish on Jews uh, and the church. And I have, I have in my possession from Grayzell uh, his original photographs that he made in the Vatican um, 80 years ago. And the quality is so high that you read them today as though they're new. Uh, anyway, the, uh, uh, where were we? Uh, the, 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 something changed in the middle of the 16th century. Largely responsible for that was a guy named Martin Luther. Uh, he broke up the church and the church was very, very concerned about, about faith and faith matters. And it was also concerned about maintaining itself uh, because uh, not only did Luther break off, another guy named the, the husband of Anne Boleyn, better known to you as Henry VIII, or maybe you know him as Anne Boleyn's husband, he broke off too. And he was more threatening than Luther because Luther was just a heretic, you know, he doesn't believe right. Henry VIII said he had the full power over the church. He was the head of the church. Now, you know, popes care about two things. One, Catholicism. Uh, we'll leave that to them. Uh, and uh, the other thing is power over Catholicism. And uh, the, uh, uh, this is what the church has specialized in in the last 500 years, uh, consolidating the church. Um, and uh, even when they deal with Jews, you must remember it has to do with how does this better for the church? It's not that we like Jews or do we hate Jews. It's too often history of popes, this pope was good to the Jews, this pope was bad to the Jews. There is no such thing. There was only a pope who was following canon law, the law of the church and the theology of the church and the Jews, sometimes more rigidly, sometimes less rigidly, but they were always following it. Until the year 1555, when somebody who, who was described by his contemporaries in Italy as Don Meshiga uh, became, and he really was, I mean, they, 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 they really thought he was crazy, named Paul IV, John Pietro Carafa became, uh, became Pope. And he decided that Jews should live closed off. 
Now, this wasn't an absolutely new idea. It had even been bandied about before in Rome 10 years earlier, uh, and uh, in Spain also in the last decades of Jewish existence, their Jews were kind of closed quarters. But it was never, and, and of course, the first ghetto itself is in Venice. After all, what's the origin of the word ghetto? Well, ghetto is the name of an island where did you put the place where Jews were going to live? It came from Jetari, from throwing. They used to cast copper or something factory. Uh, it's on the outskirts. Many of you have probably been to Venice. You know that it's it's you know it's far out from the center, uh, closed in completely, walled by canals. Um, they even walled up the windows there so the Jews wouldn't look out and others wouldn't look at Jews because the big problem with Jews, as far as the church is concerned, is contact. You can, you can corrupt something and bring impurity by contact. The church also could not expel Jews. Kings in France, England, and so they expelled Jews. But Paul IV said, no, I can't expel them because we need them. We need them for the end of days. We need them because they're just part of our law. They're guaranteed. So I will expel them into the ghetto. This is the big difference. King of England expelled them out of England. Kings of France, out of France. The popes expelled them into the ghetto. This is a very major issue, into the ghetto. Uh, and there the Jews were going to live from uh, 1555, July of 1555, until September the 20th, 1870. Now, normally in history, you cannot pick such precise dates, but here you can. First, we know when he ordered them to live there. Most of them were living in the area anyway, of course, the same area where the synagogue is today, which by the way, if you go on the Tiber River and the, the Garibaldi Bridge, about three quarters of the way over, you look to the left, you see the synagogue, you look to the right, you see St. Peter's, and they look to be the same height. And that is no accident. The synagogue was built with the great help of the city heads of Rome in 1903. And they wanted it to send a message to the Vatican because there was a war between the Vatican and the, uh, and the lay leaders of Rome at the time. The Pope was closed in, he was furious, he had lost his state because the Pope, the papal state was once one third of all of Italy, the whole center of Italy from practically Naples all the way up close to Venice um, uh, with, with Tuscany, the area of Florence cut out. But the, 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 uh, the Pope was, was, was the king there, which meant he also had to run a secular state. Which meant there were limits to what he could do. For instance, kosher meat. He had to let the Jews get kosher meat. But how do you get kosher meat? You need Christians. Why do you need Christians? To bring the animals and to do all kinds of other things. And so you have Jews and Christians actually working together. Of course, with all the shechita done, done strictly by rabbis, but, uh, and, and other work too by, by uh, Jewish uh, uh, apprentices. But, uh, but the, the two had to be an absolute cooperation. Anyway, the, the, the Pope ha has these three Jews. He has to deal with them and he closes them in the ghetto. So they're closed from 1555 until the papal state falls on September the 20th, 1870. And one of the things that they wanted to do was we'll make the Jews equal to everybody else. No more religious law. And that is a sign of uh, emancipation. In fact, emancipation is something that people talk about. Well, the Jews gradually, gradually, gradually got rights. It's not true. The Jews did gradually get privileges that moved more freely. I'm talking about 18th century Europe now leading up to the French Revolution, uh, not the American colonies for a second, but the French Revolution. But for all that, that, the, that the Jews get more and more privileges, there's a problem because the legal system, the legal system is based on religious law. It was something called jus comune. Jus comune translates as common law. It's a derivative of ancient Roman law. Ancient Roman law was already Christianized by the sixth century. It was only when Napoleon in 1804 threw out this jus comune and installed in its place the French civil code, le code civil, that was when Jews could become emancipated. In the United States, it was de facto, that is, Nobody ever had religious law as the law. Well, they, they, they did actually in Massachusetts, Connecticut, but that broke down 
the big one who broke it down was James Madison, by the way. Uh, he, he wrote a letter to Mordecai Emanuel Noah saying, if we have religious law and religious discrimination, all our civil liberties will go. But in the United States, they're very, very clear that, uh, that being a citizen, George Washington writes to the Jews of Rhode Island and he says to them, you know, um, the, the, he says the famous lines we give to bigger, bigotry, no quarter, everybody cites this letter. But in fact, what he said is you're good citizens, you're good people, you obey the law and people who obey the law are good citizens. That was his qualification for a citizen, somebody who obeyed the law. They didn't have immigration problems in those days. Uh, so uh, that's a different world. But the Jews in the Roman ghetto are living strictly under canon law and it becomes very, very difficult and very, very precise. And one of the things, and that's where we're getting directly to this book, this is all background, but you, if you don't give it to you, you will not understand what's going on in this book. Uh, one, of the, one of the things is that there were cases of people who offered, that's a technical word, not to make, you know, I offer you a cup of tea or something like that. There are people who offered uh, other people to the House of Conference. Who offered other people? Well, it could be if a father converted, and there were, and we know the names of all the people who converted. Uh, if a father converted and say, I offer my children, they would be quickly taken and baptized. No ifs, no ands, no buts. He couldn't offer his wife, but of course, what wife is going to refuse? She has three children and she sees them taken from her and she's not allowed to ever to see them again. She's going to convert to. So it's a chain. The other thing was a young man converts, and that's specifically the case here. Uh, Mr. What was his name? Sha Shaul or Samuel Cohen. Uh, and uh, he offers Ana del Monte. Now, we are not talking about some rich duke or something of a Jew who converts. And all. We're talking about a Luftmensch. And the ghetto has had plenty of them. Uh, we're talking about somebody who had no prospects, no nothing. She's from a very good family. And he goes and he says, she's my fiance. Now, he clearly didn't say that, that he may have said, Arusim. he didn't say, Mekudashim. if they'd been Mekudashim, she was finished. If there was, if there was a Tabat, all gone. But Erusin, as Chaim Soloveitchik himself once told me, has no real halachic stand. It's no, uh, it's, it's, it's sort of a, a loose kind of thing and she could play. So they take her into the house of converts and they can keep her for 12 days. Most people got taken in, they were kept for a quarantine. If you hear quarantine, you hear 40, quarantine. Quarantine, by the way, the 40 days comes from Venice. This is apropos of today, because when there was a plague and ships would arrive with foreign sailors, they kept them for a quarantine for 40 days in the ships. And that's the origin of the term quarantine. Anyway, um, they, uh, they, they, they could keep her only for 12 days. The question was, would she convert? As I say, she was hardly the only one ever taken in. We have a lot, a lot, a lot, excuse me, of examples. In the early 19th, 18th century, we have 23 examples of the heads of the community being told to produce somebody for the House of Congress. And this was really a very, very rough, very hard thing for them to do, but they had to do it. They had no choice or they would have been, they would have been fined, they would have been imprisoned. And in fact, nobody wanted to be ahead of the community in the 18th century, largely for this reason. The community was broke, by the way. It had no money. It couldn't afford anything. Even the meat they were eating was buffalo. What is buffalo? Buffalo is, is an ox-like character. Now, today, buffalo are very important because they produce the milk that makes the mozzarella with a special taste, the stuff that you really like. And it can be had kosher, by the way, with a with hash. But uh, but in any case, that's all they could eat. No one else wanted to eat it. Uh, the uh, well, so they, they're, 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 it's not rare. It's not rare. And in fact, uh, we uh, Attilio Milano, who is the uh, really important historian of 
the ghetto, his book, unfortunately, the ghetto of Rome from 1964, has never been translated, probably never will be. It's a pity because it's, it's, it's really a wonderful book, way, way ahead of its time. And uh, of course, that's because the people in the historical profession don't want to translate it since he made his living manufacturing stocks in, uh, in, in Hod HaSharon in Israel. Uh, but uh, but he, he, no, he, he wrote all kinds of things. He spent the, probably his brother was running the business and he was writing and working in the archives. The, uh, any, anyway, uh, the, the, uh, uh, where were we? The, the, uh, we know he, uh, Milano says that about a quarter of the people got out who were taken in there, which seems to me rather, rather a reasonable thing. Well, this Anna was taken in, she says, the diary says when she was 17 or 18 years old. Well, that would bring us to about 1749, 1750. We know that she was dead by 1779 from something that's said in the diary itself. So she didn't live a long life, but of course this is the 18th century and to live a life of 45 years was not exceptional. You know, people, uh, we all think of life expectancy today as 85 years or something like that. But uh, maybe some of you remember that, uh, that no, no earlier than 30 or 40 years ago, life expectancy was 60 or something like that. So to live 45 years in that period, it's a normal life. But, but in any case, she left, she says she left some notes. We don't know exactly what she left because as I said, there is only one copy of this diary that's in existence which Sermon had to transcribe. So she writes this diary and, 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 and her brother, whose name is Tranquilo, which is, would be in Hebrew, it's Menucha. Um, and uh, he, he decides to make it public. Now, what make it, made it public? What exactly did he mean by making it public? He didn't publish it because we'd have more than one copy. This is the publishing of late 19th, 18th century. It's no big deal. Anybody can make a book, publish a book, sell it in a couple of thousand copies, and then it floats around. No, no, no. It never, it was too dangerous because it says terrible things about the church. She in the diary says, says awful, awful things. I suppose I should have gone through it and picked up a, a couple of pieces. Nothing did you, do you remember anything in particular? Because you just reread it. Um, and, uh, and, and, and she, you know, she says your religion is nothing. You, you do this, you do that, and, and, and so on and so forth. Well, Tranquilo worked on it, maybe with someone else, and they pass it around. There are lots of reasons why I think that he published it. This, this has to be guessed at. For one thing, he, this, he does it in 1793. Now, when we write history, we tend sometimes 1793 Italy, we think of 1793 Italy. But 1793 means the American Constitution has been ratified already since 17, what is it, 86. The French Revolution has already granted the Jews equality, theoretical equality and citizenship. The Jews in, um, in, in, um, in Austria are getting a, a better deal than they used to have, to say the least. And the Jews in Tuscany, that's right on the border of the Papal State. Um, by the way, if you ever go and there's a town on the border in Tuscany called Pitigliano, there are no Jews there. You get kosher wine comes from there, by the way. Uh, but uh, they've maintained all the institutions. It used to be a place where Jews would go and live, and then they'd go into the papal state and work and lend money and go back to Pitigliano. It's hard to get to, but it's worth it. I've been with a tour group up there, and they said it was the height of the trip, and the trip was Jewish in. Uh, so... Uh, the, the, um, where, where were we here? Well, well, uh, anyway, um, I lost, I lost my trip, my tracks. So. The, 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 in Tuscany, what was going on in Tuscany? Oh, what was going on in Tuscany? Yes. In Tuscany too, Jews were becoming much more free and particularly in the city of Livorno, Lakehorn, um, which, uh, they, they were, they were, there was never a ghetto there because there were Sfardim who had been invited. They were terribly important. Uh, there is a, a wonderful book. It's a little thick by a Francesca Tribolato called The Familiarity of Strangers, which is about these people, the Ergas and Silvera family. 
certainly, names which may register to you if you've been in Israel, certainly. Uh, I have a friend, the Rome Miriam Sinbera, uh, and, uh, and it, it, it traces these people, and they're, they're, they're really special. She's a, a very important friend of mine, but also an incredibly great scholar. Uh, and uh, she wrote this book, which I urge everyone to try at least to read part of. All of it you won't be able to because it gets theoretical, but uh, but it's a wonderful book. Uh, anyway, yeah, and, and she, by the way, Nachi said she wouldn't mind being asked to uh, to participate. Uh, she's at the Institute for Advanced Study. Only that, uh, uh, and uh, and and anyway, uh, they, they know what's going on, and they're saying, "What is this in Rome? With the, life is getting tougher and tougher." And in 1775, the Pope Pius VI really, he just went over the deep edge. He said, no, Christians can't come in to remove refuse from the ghetto. What are you gonna do? The water supply, the Jews have been very particular. They, I have records of them repairing the, the drains and building pipes and all kinds of things. Rome, interestingly, had sewage, public sewage, 200 or 300 years before the rest of Europe, already from the 16th century. Well, uh, the, the, uh, the, he, he won't let them do that. He won't let laundry women come in to, to, to take, the, take the clothes out. There wasn't enough water in the ghetto to wash clothes. And the Jews write and they say, wait a minute, what are you doing here? We were going to have a plague that's going to go out of the ghetto into the whole city. More than that, there's something really weird. In, in, in the Jus Comune, the Jews are denominated citizens. And the common legal opinion, and I write about this in this book, the common legal opinion of all the great lawyers was the Jews are entitled to absolutely equal rights in anything that doesn't have to do with religion. Now, I mean, there's a lot of room there, anything that has to do with religion. But uh, the, uh, in, in, if the Jew went to civil court, if, I, if, if, if you were a Christian and you had stolen money from me and I went to court, you would be condemned. If, uh, if, if you had to trick me in a land deal or something or a commercial deal, I could go to court and I could get Christian lawyer. One of the things I wanted to do over much time and haven't been able to do because it's, it just doesn't seem to be records is to see if I can, I can identify lawyers, Christian lawyers who work for Jews to see if I could follow them and their careers and anything we could learn. But uh, I just have not been successful in doing that. That's, that's too bad. Uh, but it, it would be fascinating to see. Uh, there was one in particular who features in this book, a Carlo Luti, who tells the Pope when the Pope comes up with some ID, he says to the Pope, listen, you're, 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 this is just papal arrogance, which, which is rather amazing. Um, uh, it, it, it has to do with, with, with rules about when you could take someone into the house of converts and when you couldn't. And it's a classic legal text because he builds all kinds of things from the past and by putting together, putting them together, he creates something entirely new. Uh, anyone who knows law knows that that's classic work because, you know, it's all here, we had it in the past, there's nothing new here. And one of the things that's new actually by osmosis is who can offer somebody? Originally it had to be a, a parent or a husband or something, somebody like that. But bit by bit and by this time, they're even allowing uncles and cousins. And another legal scholar says, if we keep up with this, we'll allow some, we'll even allow in-laws to offer people. And it's very, very threatening. The most threatening thing of all, I would say, uh, was the question of women who would be pregnant and their fetus would be offered. Those women would be dragged immediately into the house of converts and held there till the child was born and the child would be immediately baptized. Why did they drag them in? Well, there's a legend that goes back to the fifth century. It's called the Jew of Bourges. And it, you can find it everywhere. The, the, uh, the question of why the women were the, the Jew of Bourges. The Jew of Bourges is that a young man comes to his father, a Jewish man, and says, I want to I want to convert or I took the Eucharist. And the father is so angry that he throws the son into a furnace. The son, of course, is saved by the virgin. And this this legend goes all over Europe. Somebody named Gonzalo de, de Berceo, who was who's in a, a monastery 
somewhere in the middle of the wilds of Rioja in Spain. I mean, it's 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 uh, it makes the Enemec Belt look like New York. Uh, it's and I've been there. It's it's really uh, even he's got it in his praise of the Virgin. This thing goes on, and if you think about it, it's it it it. it, it you know, the kid is obviously in the furnace. He's really a, a communion wafer. Uh, so the Jews attack and burn communion wafers. The Jews attack Christianity. The Jews contaminate Christianity. This is the constant theme uh, in, in the Middle Ages. And, you know, it really isn't that new with racial anti-Semitism e either, is it? It's just it's a laicization of that. Uh, so it goes many different directions, but still it's, it's linked. Anyway, uh, the story reaches its climax with a, a, a boy called Shimon Abelis in Prague uh, at the end of the, it was the end of the 15th, the end of the 16th century. He's about to convert and there's a fire and he dies or something like that. And, or they, they just accuse the father of killing the kid and so on and so forth. It's the ultimate development of this. So they're afraid the Jewish mothers who if they're taken will either kill the child when it's born or they will abort beforehand. Uh, and 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 I mentioned abortion before, and you have to know that abortion, and you think that it's from time immemorial in the Catholic Church, and actually it isn't. It's really only from about this time, because uh, you you have legal opinions that it's the wrong thing to do, but it's not a mortal sin until around this time. Why? Because the old medieval opinion was that the uh, the fetus is like an apple hanging from a tree. And it's like an apple hanging from the tree. It's not independent. It's part of the mother. Now, they're not interested in, in life in the biological sense. They're interested in the soul. If it's an apple hanging from the tree, you can't baptize it because that's like by baptizing the mother twice. And you can't baptize anybody twice. It's an insult to the, to the sacrament. In the 18th century, the, the so-called science develops uh, that the uh, that, uh, then they say that the fetus is independent, therefore it can be baptized. And this had tremendous effects. I won't go into them because they're rather gruesome about cesarean sections. Cesarean section in the 16th century, you can imagine what that meant. Uh, uh, they, they did not have antibiotics, did they? Uh, so uh, they, the, uh, uh, they're, they're afraid that Jewish women will actually do these things and they drag them in. So all these things build up together. And, uh, and it, it's just too much pressure on uh, this Tranquilo. And he also has a specific case of somebody who, who is married and is offered and he somehow saves her. And he was also a mohel. And he, when the child is born, they got the baby the woman back and he was the, uh, the mohel for this child. And I think that's the thing that kicked him to, to kind of make this thing public. People challenged him and said, well, you can't prove anything else, but just look at the whole thing altogether. Now let's look at the dyer itself, at the building up. I'm not saying, well, let's get, get to, the, the, to the meat, but I, but I want you to, to, you know, what's going on? Ah, one, one other little thing that's very important to know. A girl who was taken in, to the house of converts like Anna. Even if she got out, she is spoiled merchandise. Nobody will marry her. It's too dangerous. She could have promised the children in order to get out. She could have, uh, they, they could, on the slightest pretext, she could say in public, I believe in God. They say, ah, but God is the Trinity. You drag her in and baptize her again. And so nobody, so, so we know this, we know that the lawyers were complaining that, that uh, they, they said that, that people shouldn't be taken to the house of converts. They should be taken privately to find out what they want. And if they say no, let them out. Well, the diary. The diary itself is the 12 days that she's there. And I would like to, to just read for you the, the uh, first, uh, page of this thing because it will give you an idea of what's going on. She goes on. Without warning, on the 20th of April, 1749, at the end of the Passover festival, Sunday at about 17 hours, that's the way they, they counted them, things were different, I was kidnapped and taken away by force thanks to a false denunciation made against my family by a scoundrel, 
the Hebrew is Rasha. All right, they, they write Rasha. Sometimes they write Hebrew words into the diary. I was totally innocent, but he tricked the vice regent, that's the head of Rome uh, for all technical purposes, into issuing, issuing an order that led straight away to the Bargello, the sheriff and his men bursting into my home and seizing me. They sandwiched me in between them with their pistols drawn. They did not even give me the courtesy or the time to change my clothing or to say a word to my mother and father as though I were a whore, slapping everybody around and paying no attention to people's rank or even their state of health. They snapped me up like a, like a buffoon in such haste that I still had on my, my apron. And when my father tried to speak to me, they shoved a pistol into to his face. Only God saved his life. I was pushed into a carriage next to the sheriff and taken with the speed of the wind to the Casa de Catecumene, the house of converts. When we arrived at the house, I was put into the hands of the prioress, who took me by the hand. She led me into a small room which had a small bed for one person, a little table with a drawer for food, which could be locked. I was left alone until the prioress appeared for the first time to visit me, telling me to pray to God that I be illuminated to convert and to be contrite. I responded boldly. Now, this is the, the theme of the diary. It comes on every day that she's there. I responded boldly and with pluck that I had already been illuminated. They mean illumination to Catholicism. She means as a Jew. And that I had no intention of being deceived to desert the religion into which I was born. Each time she approached, approached me with the same priest, I told her that I was committed to the faithful, to his divine majesty, praying that he give me the strength and grace to return to the arms of my parents and to their belief, and that I would be happy should I be considered worthy in the true light of our holy Sabbath. Well, it goes on like that each day. Then they come to her and they ask her, what do you want for dinner? And she tells them two eggs. One she's going to put away so she can keep count of the days. But think a minute. Why would she ask for two eggs? Why doesn't she ask for, you know, uh, some salad? Why doesn't she ask? Well, she's certainly not going to ask for meat. Why doesn't she ask for, for because the egg, of course, is kosher. It's, and, 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 and this is part of the thing. We have to be whole. We have to be fast. And it goes on every day like this. Uh, the and, and more and more and more pressure. And he, she keeps reiterating, I'm not going to give in. I'm not going to move. Uh, and no matter what they do to her, and they do, there is a terrible person who comes in, a priest who's a convert. Now, the converts, you know, once you become a convert, it's better to attack the Jews. Once you become a convert, you have to be, you know, really rigorous so that uh, you can keep, uh, uh, keep in, in good graces and get a job from this. Um, and, uh, and, and that's, that, that, that's, that's exactly what they're doing, but this guy is really crazy. And at one point he comes in and he dances around her and he's got a chain and he's waving it over her head and they're throwing their 10 priests in the room with her. Can you imagine this? Think of this, this poor 18 year old girl surrounded by 10 priests and they're throwing water all over her. And meanwhile, the more they throw the water, the more what happens when you throw water on somebody's clothing, the more the clothing clings. So the more she feels naked and the more she feels like she's being ravished. It's, it's, it's an emotional rape, essentially, that's going on here. But she holds up. She says, and she, this is a refrain of the book, they're trying rubare l'anima, to steal my soul. Now, to steal my soul, somebody tried to translate this to means to steal my free will. Now, free will, it can be, it can be squashed, but you can't steal somebody's free will. It's, it's just part of their innate structure. What it means, Rubare l'anima, is much more. It means to steal my identity. An Italian today would use that phrase in the sense that they're trying to take away my identity, who I am. I am Jewish through and through. I belong in the ghetto. I want to go to my parents. I want to live with my home. I want to want to observe the Shabbat. She, go, she keeps going on with all of these things. And, and the, the prioress, who is also the prioress and the head of the uh, woman's head of the, of the monastery, uh, she, she says, but I loved you and I'm so disappointed. And she gets so angry. It, it, 
you, you have to actually read it to experience it. The drama builds and builds and builds. And that's why I'm sure that it was structured by the brother. Uh, and, 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 and ultimately, the, this vice regent calls her and says, you know, you're important. It's, it's your last chance, but I'll let you go. And she says, no, I'm going home. And then I know I've been brief in the diary, but, but uh, it's, it's really, you, you just have to read it and read it. I hope I, I enticed you with the background of it to see it because, because each day it gets more and more. They come in more, they bring in new priests, they, they pour the water, they, they, they put pressure on it. Then she dreams at night of her grandfather uh, uh, who, uh, and, and she says, I dream of him with this Simon. The Simon, the, 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 is actually the, 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 the hat which Jews were forced to wear uh, in the ghetto. Uh, and, uh, but what Jews do with these things is they make, they make these things, oh, well, they're part of our custom. That's wonderful. We, you know, we, this is you know, our identification badge. They steal the thunder from it. The, uh, in the Middle Ages, they asked that when they first start with a badge, what the, there are only a couple of references to it. One of them, is amazing. What's the question they ask? Well, if it's sewed on, can you wear it on Shabbat? Once they've made it a halacha category that's acceptable, then it's not so fearsome, is it? What you know is not fearful. So that's what they did with this, this uh, uh, hat. Uh, and she dreams of him and she sees birds in the morning and she knows that she's going to make it through. And at the end, they take her home and there's an incredible scene of people coming in and out of the rooms. And then they go to the Beit Knesset the, the next Shabbat. And of course, you know, the, the women are sitting separately and differently. They may even have been in a room off to the side, but they were still there. Uh, there were even women prayer leaders, by the way. Uh, and uh, we know the name of one at least. Uh, and uh, it's it's great festivity, and then they come, they bring their dresses and things like this, and they say, that's the end of the diary. Why does it end that way? They're trying to pretend that it really wasn't so bad. That's false. It's fictitious. I'm sure it is. It's not the way it ended was the way I said before. She was just left broken, probably broken in spirit as well as uh, unmarriageable, and so on and so forth. Uh, and that's this sad diary. And I read the diary as the protest of Tranquilo against the situation of the Jews. How absurd it is that in 1793 in Italy, when the Jews all over that we know are moving out of the ghetto, they're being emancipated, they're attaining equality. And believe me, they know they, 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 and it's not just what I think. They were writing letters to Jews in all the towns and all the places and receiving back information from them and their charters and, and so on and so forth. They knew absolutely not. And also the ghetto is in the prison. Jews left. They, they, they did business elsewhere. They went in they went out. Uh, they knew very well what was going on. So how absurd what's going on in Rome. And the, the, the absurdity was sensed by people outside and the other chapters in the book talk about uh, how she, how, how the, the, the legal structure was such that Jews are citizens on the one side and yet completely restrained on the other, which makes it very clear, and that's the importance of this book for the study of the history of emancipation, which make it very clear that until the legal system per se is completely revised, until that happens, which was something that was desired throughout Europe and had nothing to do with Jews, because they just wanted to get rid of this kind of structure of the state. They wanted to make the state secular. Until that happens, then you know nothing is going to move for the Jews in emancipation. And of course, it doesn't happen until 1870, which was when the Jews rush out of the ghetto. Uh, and then in 1938, of course, we have the racial laws, where they're effectively put into a ghetto again, not with walls, but in terms of the laws and in terms of what was going on. Uh, fortunately, uh, more Roman Jews, relatively speaking, survived the Shoah than elsewhere, largely because they were warned ahead of time. A lot of them just simply ran into Naples. Uh, some in the north got out, they crossed the Alps into Switzerland, which wasn't such an easy thing because the Swiss sent people back. 
Uh, and uh, But still, of the Roman population, uh, you had about the 16 or 1700 people who were uh, taken away and who died ultimately in Auschwitz. And it was literally beneath the Pope's window. And uh, the big thing is that during all this time that the Jews are in the ghetto and whatever, there were limits to papal action. Even, even this terrible Pius VI eventually had to relent uh, on so much of what he wanted to do. Uh, but they, they, they had to protect the Jews. They had to preserve them. They would always speak out if somebody was going to attack the Jews physically. I know it's not much, but at least you know they're not going to let you be killed. This time, Pius XII did not speak out. And to me, that was, you know, that's when it broke everything. The Jews always knew that the Pope would speak out. This other book that, that, that I mentioned earlier, Levy's Vindication, the point of the author is the Pope will protect us. The Pope may want to burn our books, some of them anyway, but at least he won't let anybody come and kill us. He won't let anybody convert us by force. He says to the Pope, you know, you are the, uh, the king of the nations. And uh, you, uh, you, you, it's your right to tell us whether we have to convert or not. Uh, and um, uh, he doesn't want that, of course, but he's saying you have the power over us. We trust you. And he cites papal law, actually, on this. But here, Pius XII did not. And that was, that was the big difference. He did. Uh, there were Jews saved all over in Rome. There's, a, interestingly, the, this House of Converts is next to a church, Madonna dei Monti, and there's a cupola. But, you know, the, the inside of the cupola is not the outside of the cupola. There's a huge airspace in between. And they had Jews hiding up in that cupola in the church. There, there were all kinds of things that were going on like that. But uh, today, incidentally, they're, they're putting little markers, bronze markers, on the pavement outside of houses where Jews were taken in the Shoah. It's rather, it's rather moving. So it's a chapter in the history of this extraordinary community, uh, which still retains very much its identity and very much its sense. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's strengthening, it's weakening, it suffers from intermarriage like, like all Jewish communities do. Uh, but uh, it will hold on and it will go on. But this was an amazing episode and I thank you for giving me the chance to talk about it. Uh, well, uh, thank you for, for coming on and talking about it. I want to add, before we uh, finish the recording, I want to add that, like you mentioned about the diary, it's pretty fascinating. The diary is pretty small. I mentioned the book, it's like 30 pages with yeah. explanatory notes. And then there's, there's, like you said, there's a lot of other discussion about it. You have other chapters in the book. The diary, like I said, it's very gripping. It goes through the whole thing. Um, there's every day who comes in, there's 12 days, and then they're just trying to get her to say yes, because they're, yes, they're going to take it and they're going to grab it. And, oh, yes, you agreed to convert. And then, like right. you said, you, you portrayed the whole scene when she gets home. And then there, there's more in there, like I said, the whole, the, the, she has the dream with the grandfather, and then she wakes up and she says to him, and she, you know, and like you said, the whole time she's talking about, she's dominating Myriv, it's Shabbos. It, there's just, it, it's just a really fascinating um, diary to read about what happened. Um, I will include the link to the book in the show's notes. Also, um, I, I mean, I mentioned this to you before we started recording that. I mean, I, I don't think it's that expensive new to begin with and definitely it can be gotten used for pretty cheap. If anybody wants to read it, yeah. like, it's a fascinating read. You can get it used. No, everybody has to buy it new because maybe I'll, I'll finally get, get, get to pay off my debt to Yale or something. I don't <laughs> Yeah, well, they can buy it new or they can buy it used. But yeah, it never, never well, you, you buy, buy it, you buy it used, yeah. It's a fast, exactly. It's if it's, it's a, uh, a terrific, um, fascinating read. So uh, just as we wind down here, I would ask you: Are there any other? You mentioned a couple of the books. You had other books on the topic or on the Roman ghetto that you would mention, and also, finally, on uh, are there any other? What are you not even like? I, I mentioned a couple of your books. There's other ones that I didn't mention that you wrote as well. Are there any other? Is there any new future project that you're working on now? Well, uh, I want to urge everybody to read Theater of Acculturation too. It's a book which which has been used. Uh, in a lot of college courses, especially at Princeton. Sociologists like it very much. They don't know whether it's history or sociology. In fact, it mystifies them that I could have both, and I'm not a sociologist by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, and it, it's really fascinating about, about Jewish life in Rome, and it, it, it's a book which, uh, which has done exceedingly well, uh, so it's worth talking about. What I'm working on now, is, uh, as I indicate, well, I've mentioned some other books, 
as I said, the best book is in Italian, so you all have to learn Italian to read it, Milano's book. Um, there is um, there's a very interesting book, uh, Life with the Evil Pope by uh, uh, Martina Mampieri, M-A-M-P-I-E-R-I. It came out of Brill, and it's the story of somebody who was arrested and taken to the court of the Inquisition in Rome. Um, it wasn't because he was heretical or anything like that. Um, a, a Benjamin ben El Natan of a city outside of Rome. It's, it's a fascinating, she brings his whole report. Uh, it's really a lovely piece of work. It's only a young scholar and it's out only a year. Um, uh, there's David Sorkin's book on the enlightenment, which I think is a very good introduction S-O-R-K-I-N. Um, then there is a collection of essays, people want to get more technical by David Ruderman, which is, is one of mine in there. Uh, and then there are the books of uh, uh, Robert Ruvain Bonfield, uh, whose Italian is much better than mine. Uh, uh, and uh, actually his mother language is Greek and he speaks Portuguese with his wife because uh, she's from Brazil. But, uh, but his mother was a Greek speaker. Uh, and uh, he has he his 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 great book is uh, the, uh, the book on have it uh, run over and get the title uh, on the rabbis of Italy and that is that is really if you're interested in rabbinic history you simply must read that book it is it is a truly important book and then he has another uh, book on Jewish life in Renaissance Italy which is pretty. Uh, easily to, to read through, uh, and that's uh, Jews all over Italy. Uh, Bonfield is an exciting historian. He's actually a mathematician, uh, and he writes history like a mathematician or a physicist. Everything is structured, uh, but it's, it's interesting. And then before Ariel, if you want to get upset, no, it's not in English, fortunately. Ariel Toff's Passovers of Blood, which is which he effectively tries to get you to believe that blood libels are real. And it's a, it's a, it's a shanda and a cherpa. And, they, 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 and, I, and I've written at, at length about why it is. And it's but but uh, if you want to you know if you want to have indigestion, it's a good book. Uh, the um, but again, I don't think it's been translated. No one would get near it. Uh, but uh, and then for for Venice, the the work of Ben Ravid and a, another scholar, an art historian, Donna Katz. Spell like cats, uh, and um, they are rabid as R A V I D, Ravid in Hebrew, he's an American Bostonian doc. Uh, and uh, th those, are, those are the really good things that I think are, are available now, uh, parallel. And of course, David Kurtzer's uh, The Kidnapping of uh, Edgardo Mortara, for which I'm eternally angry because I would have called this The Kidnapping of Ana del Monte, uh, but I couldn't. <laughs> So there, it's it's a good book. It's written it's written nicely. There, there's some there's some of the historical argument is a little equivocal, but but still, it's a good book. You want to enjoy reading it. Yeah, and as you mentioned in the beginning of Martina Mampieri, so I interviewed, I have interviewed her. Many listeners probably will listen to that interview. We discussed her book, which is oh. really interesting, but just published by Brill, so it's about two hundred dollars. But uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I said, well, why in the hell? I mean, she's a young scholar, and she she she's very good. And of course, she's not Jewish, but she's learned Hebrew very well. It's it's uh, so she's trying to work on Yeshaya Zana, who was absolutely fascinating character, uh, who um, uh, who published it in Hebrew along with all kinds of documentation, really important documentation. Me Pius Harvi ad me Paulus Harvi ad Pius Achamishi, and. Uh, so there was that, and then and you mentioned there's a couple of other books as well. So either I'll put them in the post or anybody wants, they could email me. And then finally, before we finish uh, finish up, um, you were mentioned what you're working on currently. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm working on meat, uh, as I said. I, the, the question of the provision and slaughter of meat in the, in the Roman ghetto, which is truly amazing. I think in some ways it shows enormous light on what Jews uh, could uh, could uh, could accomplish? How are they going to get themselves meat? People in cities ate meat in those days, believe it or not. I have never been able to figure out exactly how much. Um, it, you can't you can't figure out how how in Rome people cut meat anyway. I guarantee anybody here goes to Rome and looks into a butcher shop, you'll never know what you're looking at. It's uh, totally unlike uh, anything that you have here, uh, and. Uh, 
but but the, the, the question was, how would they work with Christians? How did they work with canon law? How did they get involved with each other? How scandalous were they? Of course, it's kosher meat. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, 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 and it's, it's, it's all of these issues come together and also a certain crisis that occurred when they prohibited Jews because what, what they would do from the best of my knowledge is they would slaughter the animal, the shochet, of course, and they cut it into four parts. One of the hindquarters, they actually did nikur on, which is amazing. They, they actually did it. And then the other one, they would sell to Christians, which was, it was cheaper meat, but Christian butchers would take it and sell it. And then there was the inside. And the, the Romans have a whole litany of things they do with the innards, which are a quarter of the meat. So it's, uh, it's all this kind of stuff. And uh, it's rather fascinating. And I still have a few questions to answer. Uh, one of them being what happened when the racial laws came in, uh, was the old regime somehow restored and Jews couldn't sell their meat because the, the racial laws are also linked with the Pope's agreement of 1929 with Mussolini. So I think I'm gonna see if I can learn something about that. I don't think I will. Uh, um, I know that Ricardo has written a good, a wonderful article on it that is Ricardo de Saini, uh, but not, is not strictly, he, he on the fence of Kashrut because there is a problem as we all know in Europe about uh, kosher meats, uh, about doing shchita. Uh, and, uh, you know, all these things, uh, some guy gets on the BBC and says, uh, well, you know, I don't want to eat meat that's been dedicated or blessed by another god. Literally, literally. Uh, very well. Okay. Thank you very much for joining me, Professor. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you very much for inviting me.